Minding My Business, The CEO Story with Ramesh Menon and Rishi K. Hello, as we head into the Festival of Lights, it's only appropriate that we salute these captains of the industry who have shown us the light as far as employment, wealth creation and innovation are concerned. Welcome to Episode 5 of Minding My Business, The CEO Story. It comes to you on 94.3 Radio 1 on FM Radio and in podcast form on HD Smartcast and leading streaming services. This is a Radio 1 production. I'm Radio 1 podcast host Rishi K. Let me el- uh, welcome my co-host, a man I love bantering with, Ramesh Menon, CEO of HD Media Limited. Hey Ramesh, how are you? Feeling festive, I hope? Very good. Uh, totally, Rishi. Uh, I'm feeling good. But since you talked about light, I'd like to wish our listeners a uh, very happy Diwali in advance and also remind them, to stay away the, from the crackers and, and light as many diyas as you can. Uh, on that note, let's also welcome our very, very, very special guest of the day. He's just taken over as chairman and managing director of a company that's had a soul connection with in, independent India. I, I like that. Soul connection. <laughs> Ramesh, <laughs> I have to really watch my back now. <laughs> you also taking over the mic and becoming a, an accomplished radio host. Soul connection <laughs> with independent India. Uh, well, uh, let me add, he's also a scholar who went to Stanford, who went to MIT, who uh, went to Harvard, and he's a poet and a linguist extraordinaire. And his interest in sustainability and research and development in the areas of animal feed, agriculture and chemicals is also well known. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman and Managing Director of Godrej Industries, Nadir Godrej. Mr. Godrej, wonderful to have you on the show. You would probably be the only CEO in the world who has a flair for writing poems. And that really is my first question. What or who has been the inspiration for your love for literature and poetry? My granny, Mama, was named Shireen, was always calm and never mean. Her name in Persian just meant sweet, quite apt for such a dulcet treat. A British teacher in her school who sized her well, she was no fool, quite cleverly tweaked the spelling to Serene, and there's no telling character led to the name or vice versa. All the same, serene indeed was stately, calm, for weary souls, a soothing balm, a freedom fighter for the nation and poet for the cause of liberation. With great verve she would recite, I still recall that glorious sight. A love of literature was kindled there, a love that mother would also share. She also sometimes took to worse for greeting cards that were terse. But then the art that brought her glory was a different medium, the short story. This was from a poem I wrote about my mother. So my granny Serene and my mother Jai, both literature majors, were a big influence in my love of literature and they inspired me to write. I wrote poems as a child, but in the 80s, I started writing regularly. One day, I was asked to give a vote of thanks at the Economic Times Harvard Business School Awards in Calcutta. The poem was a hit and I started making speeches in verse. Then I came across Vikram Seth's Golden Gate. In Span magazine, I read an interesting article about how Vikram read two very different translations of Pushkin's Evgeny Onegin or Eugene Onegin. One was very scholarly by Nabokov and the other by Charles Johnston was in the original form in Pushkin sonnets, which has an unusual rhyming scheme. I was studying Russian at the House of Soviet Culture and my teacher, Yudmila Sergeyevna, said that they were going to celebrate Pushkin's anniversary with Nisim Ezekiel as the chief guest. I was also asked to speak and I composed my poem, The Influence of Pushkin on Vikram Seth. Needless to say, it was written in Pushkin sonnets. Occasionally, I still write Pushkin sonnets and wrote a poem in Pushkin sonnets about a trip through the clubs of Bombay with Vikram Seth. This was recited as an introduction when Vikram visited Vikroli. Wonderful. Voila. (laughs) That's incredible. I wish we could have done, we could do this entire interview only in verse. (laughs) Unfortunately, we're not. I'm not capable of it. I'm sure, Rishi, you can do a good job of it. Uh, hello, Mr. Godridge. I mean, I really appreciate you joining us on the show. Uh, sustainability and technology uh, seem to be your favorite subjects, besides, of course, uh, poetry. Uh, tell us something about your passion for sustainability. 
Let, let me interrupt, Ramesh. Let's yeah, give this a bash. Ahead. Let's yes. give this a bash. I have an idea, and it would be absolutely unique and fun. Can we request you, Mr. Godrich, to talk about sustainability in verse? Let's do it. Okay. Ready? Let's do it. Yeah. Although there's much that seems so wrong, the folks who take a view that's long find that the world is on a surge. So let's not give in to the urge to think that there is little hope. In fact, we have a lot of scope. The world will still ameliorate all by itself, and that is great. But with the collective pact and guidelines on how we should act, things will happen that much faster. And that is why we need to master all goals of UN SDG. Of course, all of us clearly see that governments will play their roles in achieving all these goals. But we still need to understand that business can give a helping hand. And here, I think that we all ought to pay careful heed to Michael Porter. With shared value, there's no cost for doing good as nothing's lost. All it takes is a thinking brain to remove a societal pain and combine it with a business gain to create a sustainable chain of endless mutual benefit. This concept is a tremendous hit. Now, the UN has a lengthy list. So in recounting, some would be missed. So I will focus on just three that I think would be the key for all the others to fall in place and enable us to win the race. Good health through perfect sanitation, environment and education. Most of these can be seen in our program, Good and Green. It is no longer climate change within a tolerable range. A crisis is what it's about. With fires, floods, as well as drought. Every week a constant blast, far worse than seen in the past. If we must, we will adapt. Prevention, though, would be more apt. There is a cost to adaptation. It's rising fast in every nation, as well as for the world at large. This will be a heavy charge. In fact, we should all conclude prevention would be far more shrewd. It actually would cost much less and avoid a lot of stress. The situation we won't see unless we act collectively. So let us all build some trust as action now is a must. And so without partiality, our goal for all is neutrality, whether water, carbon or solid waste, very soon we will make haste to make our net emissions zero. Will that make the group a hero? In 2010, the goal looked tall, but we took a reasoned call. Technology would save the day. So far, it has turned out that way. As technology takes a leap, green energy gets very cheap. Keen observers quickly saw that solar also tracks Moore's law. But the groundnut shell or the gas are India's full of biomass. At first, we thought we'd have to spend, but that's not true for in the end, the more we thought and the more we slaved, we did invest, but we also saved. And solar is still getting cheaper. And as we start digging deeper, in India, it will hit the goal of being cheaper than even coal in a handful of years. Already, we and our peers are sourcing solar electricity at lower rates than from the utility. For quite some time, we've been extorted as their finances aren't still sorted. A silver lining can be seen since it incentivizes green. Our cost of water is not so high, but yet we do attempt to try to reduce our water consumption. But all the same, it's a safe assumption. Our water use won't disappear. And so to be neutral, I fear we will have to mitigate. Though fortunately, I can state the developing of watershed doesn't cost much and instead our agribusiness can benefit. The government will do its bit, but where it fails, we'll fill the breach and hopefully we will reach many farmers on the cheap. But the benefits that we reap will compensate for the cost. And once again, nothing's lost. In training, we will play a role. A million people is our goal. For society, we do our bit, but we also benefit. Farmers gain from better yield and buy our products for the field. Beauticians gain a livelihood as good practices are understood occasionally. They would select our products and we could elect to co-create what customers need. Together, we would all succeed. We'll contribute to the elimination of malaria and dengue in our nation. Sustainability must be won. Sustainability 
can be done. That's incredible. I mean, the way you've connected the world, uh, the country, the corporation, the 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 group, and the individual, and and really put everything that uh, we we we've heard of on sustainability, uh, all of it so. Beautiful. But you know, I actually your question was deeper than that, Ramesh. I interrupted him because of of my love for poetry, and I wanted to stoke the fires of further poems and poetry uh, with Mr. Godrej. But it was actually a very very interesting question. You know, he talked about. sustainability and technology being your favorite subjects where did that passion come from sorry to interrupt just uh, finish yeah, ramesh's yeah. answer before we proceed if i got my love of poetry from my mother and maternal grandmother i got my interest in technology from my father who was a chemist and an engineer i share a birthday with antoine laurent lavoisier the father of chemistry my father was also interested in a broad range of subjects such as linguistics etymology history and geography from him i learned the importance of intellectual range my uncle sorab was an environmentalist and i was sensitized to environmental issues but got really interested when it was clear that climate change was a significant and imminent threat incredible uh mr godrej you've you've done the country proud you've been awarded the national order of the legion of honor a french order established uh by napoleon in 1802 that's almost like a knighthood right uh talk about the honor also i believe you write poems in french uh please tell us about your french connection as well right i'm going to put from a poem uh, that i recited when i was awarded the legion d'honneur and it talks about my connection with france my love for french and for france was a good fooder from first glance My very first link I now guess was an early visit by GS. My mother wrote that when I was just two, ma cousine Genoise conversed with me en français and left an impression till this day. Perhaps that is the reason why in school I would always try so very hard when it came to French, but Hindi felt like a wrench. In 70, by happenstance, GS invited me to France. So I was quickly on a plane and then I took a rumbling train the train was slow no TGV but soon I was in Saint Tropez the beauties there gave me a scare for most of them were rather bare and very soon I came to know why this small town was called Saint Tropez of course I met a comely wench who taught me how to speak in French at school you mostly read and write so speaking french was a delight and thus began my link to france for my role in ifta and alliance uncle sorab paved the way i sorely miss him on this day like me he also had the chance to be decorated twice by france i'm glad that i have had the chance to share with you my love of france and some of you might well find the somewhat strange but love is blind and so i would like to quote from a poem that i once wrote mais mon cœur ne me donne le luxe du choix je ne sais pas pourquoi mais j'aime ces gaulois but my heart does not give me the luxury of choice i don't know why but i love these frenchies <laughs> bravo bravo that's wonderful <laughs> as i said this is an extract from a poem i read when i received the legion d'honneur it was on 26 11 the day of the mumbai attacks out they turned down invitations at the taj in oberoi because the alliance française had organized a course and celebratory dinner by the cordon bleu at the then new four seasons strangely just as we started dinner My brother started talking about my other lucky escapes the belly landing in Chennai the bomb that exploded in Baghdad airport just after my flight took off the dinner in the Seychelles which the PM attended only to hurry off because of urgent business that we later learned was a coup against the president who made the mistake of leaving the PM behind while attending a commonwealth prime minister's conference Thanks to the award the lives of my family and close friends were saved. One more reason to adore the French. <laughs> Incredible. Wow. 
<laughs> I, I'm open mouthed. So you have cheated death on numerous occasions, Mr. Godfrey. <laughs> now our show attempts to inspire people through the life and the times of successful captains of the industry, such as yourself. I have to ask you, what are the key qualities of a business leader, especially in these difficult times in the aftermath of the pandemic? The key qualities of a leader in these difficult times are empathy, resilience, and agility. A leader must understand why people are suffering and how to alleviate the suffering. Resilience ensures that we don't succumb to threats. Agility enables us to seize opportunities and convert these very same threats into opportunities. Mr. Godridge, uh, you've spoken passionately uh, in in poetry and in prose about global warming, uh, climate change, and the active threat that it is in this day and age. What's your view of uh, reimagining our lives and innovating to combat uh, climate change? Yes, uh, innovations are the best way to combat climate change, and there are all kinds of innovations. I'll run through a few, a little in verse, a little in prose. The most important is policy innovations, and the most important policy innovations is uh, effective carbon price. And one effective carbon price is a carbon tax. The other is possibly carbon trading. A uniform carbon tax would protect all our banks, collected by each nation state, but universal in its rate. All GHGs would be fair game. Every country should charge the same. The benefit that this would yield would be a level playing field. Competitors just wouldn't care because the system's very fair. Just how high should this tax be? A range of numbers we can see, but $60 per metric ton would surely get reduction done. For carbon, this could be the rate. For others, we would calibrate. The appropriate rate we could select based on the greenhouse gas effect. Based on today's emissions rate, quite candidly, I should state it wouldn't be a trivial sum. But there's no reason to be glum. In dollars, it would be two trillion. It's a lot, but not a zillion. Compared to global GDP, the percentage is less than three. Compared to taxes, then again, the percentage is less than 10. Of course, some would then take a call to reduce emissions, not pay it at all. But bear in mind, it's not a cost. For the economy, nothing's lost. A UBI could be instated. Some other tax could be rebated. And if this is indeed so, the economy would still grow. I feel that a carbon tax is perhaps the most effective way to reach our goals, but there are many other things. There are technical innovations, and uh, the technical innovations of new technologies, we've seen already what electric cars are doing, but we could foresee electric planes. Fully electric planes are very difficult because uh, batteries are too heavy to put on planes. Already, it's, uh, it's going to be, in a few years, we will see air taxis and short haul aircraft very easily. For long haul aircraft, there are technologies such as having a generator on a plane, which still uses fossil fuels, but it has electric motors powering propellers. The advantage is that the fossil fuel is used very effectively. The planes could be silent while they're landing because there would be enough batteries to turn off the generator before landing. So there are many benefits. So there are all kinds of technical innovations in user industries. Then, of course, there's energy conservation. Energy conservation is a no-brainer. Most energy conservation pays for itself. Lots of people are doing it. All it takes is a little effort. You put somebody in charge of energy conservation. He doesn't cost you any money. He saves you money. Carbon sequestration. If nothing else works, we have to work on carbon sequestrations. And there are many, many solutions. Growing trees is the best solution. Shifting agriculture to vertical agriculture and then using the land for growing trees is a possible very effective solution. Using regenerative agriculture that keeps carbon in the soil and improves agricultural productivity is another win-win. So there are many kinds of carbon sequestration. There are even some carbon sequestration technologies that fossil fuel lovers will love. One of them is enhanced oil recovery uses small amounts of carbon dioxide. It has now been found that if you add considerably more carbon dioxide, slightly more enhanced oil recovery would be done. This makes no economic sense of its own. 
but as a carbon sequestration method it makes imminent sense and it is one way of convincing fossil fuel manufacturers to do their bit <laughs> new green energy uh run of the mill units there's already a lot of progress in wind and solar but in water power we can still have progress and fusion energy if we have fusion energy we don't have to worry about climate change at all and a lot of progress is being made in fusion energy mit recently announced very powerful magnets that can contain the uh, uh, containment is the big issue in fusion energy then of course innovation ecosystems and in india we're making a lot of progress with innovation ecosystems agricultural innovation climate change innovation all these are important and finally the financing of green technologies incentives for financing green technologies should be applied people should be warned that non green technologies have no long term sustainability they should not be financed and once we preferentially finance green technologies and do not finance non green technologies we'll rapidly make progress so these are the innovation ideas that can help us solve the problem excellent let's move to the farming sector as the chairman of godrej agrovet what do you think are the few things that can actually help double or improve farmer incomes the big problems that i see are small scale and labor intensity their scope for digitization as well as efficient automation network effects can overwhelm scale there are many benefits farmers can avail input supply and output sale reliable advice without fail the technology of this new age boosts both income as well as wage now farmer incomes very low so how can we make it grow good platforms are the way to go as all these benefits can flow startups are rising here and there soon they'll be everywhere Now Godrich can play a role in attaining this noble goal and don't you think it would be great if we can also celebrate not just simple digitization but a digital transformation with these techniques we surely know that farmers income is bound to grow a bright future is what we see for oil palms new policy our ceo had a major role in india's new inspiring goal the farmers incomes are protected the producers rights are respected what producers pay and farmers get is formulated and fairly set there is no reason to roll the dice producers pay on current price but it is the long term trend that pay that spade at the farmers end any difference is directly sent to the farmer by the government this will enthuse fresh plantation in many parts of our nation thanks to our geo tagging not a single farmer will be lagging micronutrients will be supplied new harvesting techniques will be tried all this will help the yields to soar their incomes will then rise for sure at godrich agrovet you see we've invested much in r&d all our team worked very hard to set up our center ng card in india we have an urgent need to produce efficient feed now rapeseed meal has good protein but glucosinolates are also seen once they are inactivated a nutritious feed is created as soy our prices were now soaring this technology is scoring for milk feed conversion is low but there are benefits that we know the total cost of feed is low many benefits then flow not only compound feed is fed but fodder and feed both instead the room in here is our star for it can take us very far just grass and urea can su- suffice these come to us at a low price the rumen bacteria go into bat and make protein carbs and fat with this alone we can't succeed we also need compound feed especially if yield is high this comes at a higher cost but the benefit can be lost in the rumen good nutrients degrade technology leaps to our aid as treatment or encapsulation can prevent this degradation the nutrients go on their way downstream stomachs come into play almost all passes through this world is truly brave and new high quality at lower cost so all is gained and nothing lost greater resources it can be seen are needed to produce protein in india we are rather short and therefore all of us now ought to find a more efficient way to produce protein and save the day in india yields are very low 
This adds to costs, as we all know. More cows are grown, more feed is fed, you also need a bigger shed. And all this leads to higher costs. But something else is also lost. The consequences are very dire, as carbon emissions are also higher. There is a tool that we can wield, and that, of course, is higher yield. Now, normal breeding is very slow. There is a faster way, we know. We asked ourselves what could then be the cutting-edge technology. In agriculture, Israel needs, and IVF met our needs. Now, crossbreeds are a compromise, and that approach once seemed wise. The compromise that one would see was between yield and immunity. Human nature is always loath. To give up something is we want both. Of course, we want the highest yield and Indian immunity in the field. The best yield from both sperm and egg, while immunity stands on another leg. Not from parents, but something other, the placenta of the surrogate mother. Now, NG Card, our research station, is a fountainhead of innovation with steady progress in newer feed and Maxi Milk's superior breed. We are now sure we can succeed in providing protein our dire need. Although our agricultural growth is slow, all of us now surely know animal husbandry is on the rise. It is now one third the size of the agricultural economy. In this millennium, we now see plant agriculture has been troubled but fish and milk have more than doubled, while the growth in eggs has been threefold, five times as much of chickens sold. Now careful attention should be paid to the percentage growth of the last decade. The plant-based growth, just one and a half. If it weren't so serious, it would make you laugh. But the animal growth was five times more, providing sucker. And we are sure this positive trend will still endure. This is where resources should pour. In 10 more years, we should see that half the agricultural economy will by that time be animal-based. The plant economy will be outpaced. For farmers too, there's much to gain. Their over-reliance on fickle grain could lead to farmers losing all. A poor monsoon can cause a fall, but the farmer who diversifies finds that this strategy is wise. With eggs and milk, the income steady, the diversified farmer is also ready. Just in case the field crops fail, his second income can prevail. For the farmer, minimizing debt is surely a much safer bet. With our success in feed and breed, we think that we can now succeed in integrating milk supply. There's much to gain if we now try. One fact that we clearly know, the farmer incomes will surely grow. Farmer incomes will surely grow. Uh, staying with farming, uh, there's been a lot of buzz around farm reforms uh, recently. Without getting into the controversies around it, uh, what are the few reforms you feel that need to be in place uh, for enhancing yields of farmers? The government has already announced initiatives for oil palm, animal husbandry and other schemes. The new farm laws have generally met with a good response from industry. Unfortunately, farmers have some misgivings which need to be explained to them and assurances of fair treatment are necessary. As explained, earlier improvements in feed and breed technology and platforms to connect farmers, input suppliers and customers will bring many benefits to the economy and to farmers. The income will more than double. I am a founding member of FALI, Future Agricultural Leaders of India an initiative to train farmers' children in science, scientific agriculture and practical knowledge. Industry visits and apprenticeships are part of the program. At the annual conclave, the students present excellent projects. The students will be prepared for agriculture of the future or for that matter, any ancillary or other rural jobs as well. Chemicals are seen as harmful. Yet it's obvious that we can't live without them, Mr. Godrej. What is your view on the positioning of the chemicals industry? The food we eat, the drugs we take, and almost everything we make have chemicals at their base. We can easily make the case that chemicals make life worth living and chemistry is always giving. Sometimes, of course, there could be harm, but chemistry has a special charm. No matter what the want or need, with chemistry, we can succeed. Natural chemicals are just fine, but we can't assume they are benign. Natural poisons are widely seen. 
snake venom, ricin, and strychnine, whether natural or synthesized, safe chemicals should be prized. And other sectors can't survive if our industry doesn't thrive. To manufacture in our nation, we need a chemical foundation. And specialties have a special role. Solving problems is their goal. And other industries can only grow if they in turn successfully show that their customers will see a gain or else avoid inflicting pain. And if the game is cleverly played, solutions can be tailor-made. Good knowledge of the application enables true optimization. Only with deep interaction can suppliers get good traction. Standards have a role to play. They can help to show the way. Good standards are those that are seen to be healthy, safe and green. While regulation is a pain, good standards do provide a gain. A level playing field is set. Consumer's trust is duly met. User benefits will flow. User industries will grow. I think I can make an order into poetry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> fabulous to be a part. That's the genius of the man. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, with more poetry when, when you took over as chairman of uh, godrej industries limited you you wrote an ode to mr adi godrej uh, tell us about it and and maybe recite a couple of stanzas to bring out the essence actually this poem has been evolving uh, other times when i had occasion to felicitate adi i started writing this and the poem has grown and grown and grown over time and this was the latest version and i will give you a, an extract of it Adi is my elder brother. For good advice there was no other. He always took the greatest care and in all things was very fair. At school he was extremely smart. Excelled in all except for art. For fame he never seemed to hanker. In SSC he was first ranker. Then Xavier's college up to Inter, then he had to contend with Winter as his next step was MIT where When just 21 you see he was both bachelor and master and few have ever done it faster once back home he started work no matter what he'd never shirk this was way back in 63 the years passed as you can see his arrival meant rising hopes for 40 year old godred soaps just to crawl was then the size and adi set out to modernize MBAs were soon recruited and cars for managers were mooted the marketing was revamped and those who couldn't change decamped he introduced cost accounting and soon the sales started mounting but hair dye was his greatest coup and over the years it grew and grew is any success because of skill or is it more his iron will for adi was always organized and punctuality was prized By dusk his desk is very neat his paperwork is all complete not agonizing is the trick decisions must be very quick and he can't stand the status quo all novel things he wants to know and if he thinks that it is right he puts in all his will and might behind the new initiative and with support that he can give we quickly learn the latest ways make sure the group sees better days but while he strives for the group the industry is in the loop is always ready to lend a hand be president or take a stand with government on policy and he'll persist till industry gets exactly what it needs a billion indians we can say will use our product every day and everywhere it will be seen that we are great good and green adi spell was truly great the years he worked were 58 but all good things come to an end let's hope we can maintain the trend he's stepping down as you can see the mantle has been passed to me his shoes are big and hard to fill but with your support i think we will continue well in the same way as adi did in his own day he will be chairman emeritus and i'm sure he'll merit us with his presence and advice invaluable beyond any price now hearing praise can be quite tough i'm sure by now he's had enough but all the same why don't we stand and then give him a rousing hand for service to both group and nation he deserves a standing ovation 
<laughs> That's wonderful. One of my most memorable interviews of Mr. Adi Godridge is when we broke from industry talk and he talked about his jet skiing. <laughs> yes. And I said, and I said, this is a man of great talent, you know. Yes. And if he's got his jet skiing, you've got your poetry. <laughs> wonderful. So, 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 so thrilled to hear that. The Let's, whole poem has a section on his. his athletic activities ah. and, uh, <laughs> cut that out <laughs> let's talk about godrej agrovets poultry business no. uh, you have two great well known brands real good chicken yummies how's growth been and what is the future hold for your joint venture with tyson foods which is basically godrej tyson foods yes our poultry business as you said is a joint venture with tyson it has a bright future because india has protein short and chicken is a healthy and affordable source of protein real good chicken is heavily dependent on horeca and has been affected by the pandemic but in home consumption has grown so yummies is doing very well both the chicken and we have a range of vegetarian products as well in yummies we are also exporting vegetarian yummies products to the us and we hope that we can expand to other countries as well fabulous uh, yeah a poet uh. I'm sure will also be a, a, a music uh, sort of person as well. So, what kind of music do you listen to, uh, or what's on your playlist? Yes, interesting question. Uh, now, a lot of what I am comes from my parents, and I, in this musical field, my two parents were very different. My mother uh, was not interested in music at all. She used to tell me that when her music instructor came home, she would run away to the bathroom. My father was very interested in western classical music especially german composers he studied in germany for 6 years so uh, fortunately i got a little bit of my mother but i also got a love of music from my father i listen to both pop songs and classical music i enjoy pop songs in languages other than english and especially if i want to try and learn a language i like to listen to songs in that language so i listen to a lot of french songs german songs italian and spanish are languages which i don't know very well but they are so similar to french and italian is such a musical language all western music started with italian so i love listening to italian songs and i've learned italian mostly from my knowledge of french and songs amazing you know a, a thought just came to mind in terms of popular french music the hollywood actor johnny depp he was in a relationship with a Vanessa french uh, venessa paradi and she had a, a song called jole taxi ah. <laughs> which went which became a chart topper in both sides of the atlantic Absolutely. in the us as well as europe yeah. i mean subsequently the relationship didn't last but you know they were together for a while i think they even had children together but Uh, she became a phenomenon not just because of Jolie Taxi, but also because of her uh, very fame, touted relationship with uh, with Johnny Depp. So uh, th- that's my my small two bits on popular French music. Yes. A book, a book that has left an impact on you. Uh, I haven't finished the music. You also asked me. Uh, oh yes, yes. Several concerts I attended. Yes, concerts, uh, and you know, do do you own a, a vinyl or a record connection? Uh, or do, or do you now, listen to it on your on your phone? Digital now. digital now. Apple Music has everything. I <laughs> yeah, it does. Also, we want both classical music and pop songs. Also, I uh, now with internet radio, I listen to international radio station. There's a radio station in Lausanne which has a lot of French songs, and every now and then it has an Italian song, or a Spanish song, or a Portuguese song, or a German song, and occasionally they even have songs in Romansh. a uh, little known swiss language spoken in the uh, high alps <laughs> it's a different wow. of latin but it has i think less than 100000 speakers losan is where they have the uh, the the laureus sports awards and they, you know they have the you know winter olympics and all kinds of things in uh, in, in switzerland in switzerland yeah switzerland I, yes and uh, losan also has a memorial to freddy Uh, Mercury. Uh, that was in Montreux to Freddie Mercury. Not yeah, Montreux, 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 and the Swiss Alps. Yes. That's why Deep Purple also did a song called "We All Came Down uh, to Montreux." <laughs> Wonderful uh, concert. Sorry. Yeah, some memorable concerts I attended were by Queen in London. At that time, I didn't know Queen, and uh, uh, my London office arranged for it, and I'm very glad that they did. 
it was in the late 80s uh then uh, once i went to an alliance so, sorry sorry let me interrupt you was that at wembley by any chance at wembley arena did you remember do you remember where no, you saw freddie mercury and queen it was an indoor location it was a big oh. auditorium yeah i wow. forget where it was well wonderful and, sorry continue yeah yes then once i went to paris for an alliance française meeting and uh, at the sorbonne they had arranged a concert by a music the french uh, singer he actually is not so much of a singer he's more of a songwriter and he uh, he almost recites his songs george mustaki and he performed there so that was a wonderful experience then andrea bocelli came to mumbai and he had a uh, concert at brabon uh, uh, cci grounds i think it was and zubin mehta came with the israel philharmonic uh, here and another memorable concert was beethoven's ninth symphony which i heard in open air in east berlin in the narrow period of time after the wall had fallen and reunification <laughs> goodness me july or august of that year <laughs> and beethoven's wow. ninth symphony and the ode to joy and the ode to joy is now of course the national anthem of the european union it's a poem by schiller which beethoven con- converted into a song <laughs> wow i'd heard of pink floyd uh, you know uh, doing a concert at the, the very place where a most significant portion of the wall came down but this is ah. remarkable a, a western classical a philharmonic orchestra playing there yes lovely lovely It may not have been exactly where the wall was, but it was in East Germany, and I was living in West Germany. But I was able to go across for the concert. <laughs> wow! What is it called? Point Point Frank, where where the where the exact you know the exchange happens. Ah yes yes yes. Checkpoint <laughs> is it? Checkpoint Charlie. Checkpoint Charlie, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Symbolically, they still have you know a couple of soldiers standing there, but of course they're they're actors dressed as soldiers. <laughs> checkpoint charlie i completely forgot about it until you mentioned it at first i couldn't even think what it was <laughs> checkpoint charlie yeah a tank there and wonderful great great moments from history yes. uh, so yeah the the book that has left an impact on you yes i mentioned a few uh golden gate which i mentioned earlier because cyrano de bergerac which is a novel as so a golden gate is a novel and cyrano de bergerac is a play by edmond ostar and there was a movie made of it with Gerard De Depardieu playing Cyrano de Bergerac uh, it's a beautiful movie tw- uh, 20 years old uh or 30 years old by now and uh, because it is entirely in verse and one of the uh, one thing i share with Cyrano de Bergerac is my nose he had a huge nose <laughs> and And Bob <laughs> has a beautiful poem about the nose. Somebody insults his nose, so he says, "What a crude insult!" And then in his, in his poem, he recites twenty different kinds of literary insults that could have been provided instead. <laughs> uh, uh, another thing I have in common with Cyrano de Bergerac, he liked technology. Cyrano de Bergerac actually was the first science fiction writer. He wrote a novel. about man going to the moon uh, his technology was of course very primitive in the 17th century he had a cannon which fired a shot that went all the way to the moon and recently three books that impressed me they're not novels uh, they are factual books one is human kind which one is range and the other is the age of wonder human beings are essentially kind it is only the advent of agriculture and ownership of land that brought in feudalism patriarchy misogyny divisiveness and other evils range argues that it is not specialists but generalists that succeed i love being a generalist so you might say i'm biased towards this book <laughs> range argues that um, yeah uh, the age of wonder talks about science in the romantic age the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries scientists like sir humphrey davy were poets i didn't know that poets like coleridge and shelley were interested in science the theory of vitalism 
inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein? As a poet and a scientist, I was fascinated. And I would also like to state that Charles Darwin's uncle Erasmus Darwin wrote a book about evolution long before Darwin wrote about natural selection and the entire book was written in verse. <laughs> you know, Ramesh, you, you would appreciate this. Uh, when when a lot of the, the past generation was growing up, they were always told, uh, almost mortified of being jack of all trades and master of none. You know, your parents and your grandparents always said, even if you have to be a janitor or a violinist, you have to just do that with blinkers on. You can't do it. And he made a very important point about generalists. In this day and age, it's the generalists who are wanted and who seem to succeed. And you as a business leader would also appreciate that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, one would add that perhaps uh, it's you shouldn't be a jack of all trades. Uh, in a recent webinar, somebody made a very interesting point. He says you should have a T. You should be broad across all things and one specialty. And then he went okay. one better. Maybe you should be a pie, a broad curving roof and two specialties. Two specialties. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a fabulous insight. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, but I love the fact that somebody is saying that you need to be a generalist, but now I know a uh, generalist, but with a T. Yes. Two T's, right? That's, <laughs> what about a sport you follow or, uh, or a favorite player in that sport? Yes. Uh, uh, my favorite sport is swimming. And I don't follow swimming as a sport, but the sports I have followed are uh, cricket and tennis. As a child, I admired Farouk Engineer and I was very impressed when once he hit a century before lunch and I was hearing on the radio as he was doing that. But then I thought that I was very intrigued by Dravid, precisely because he was a patient plodder, someone you didn't enjoy, but someone that you grew to respect, someone who sticks it out, someone who perseveres, someone who succeeds. <laughs> Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, every every time I'm called to speak about radio, especially in schools and colleges, you know, sometimes they call me for just a lecture in communication institutes. I always liken daily, the rigors of daily morning radio, getting on the air for five hours every single day to batting like Rahul Dravid. I mean, you can be flashy like a Sehwag or, you know, a, a, a person who is able to shift gears like a Sachin Tendulkar, no disrespect to them. But if you want to do the hard yards day after day after day, it's Rahul Dravid. You know, he showed up. He showed up day after day. And that's very beautiful that you would say that. Right. That's why I put Farouk Engineer and <laughs> Rahul to, to, Dravid. Yeah, two ends of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> you need that flash of joy and you, uh, you need to learn from people like Dravid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Mr. Engineer was also a model in his time. I, you know, I see these old cutouts of him uh, uh, modeling for Brill Cream and things like that. One of the original good-looking Parsis <laughs> in the city. And then uh, in Tennis Stars, I selected my wife's favorite, Roger Federer. And it's very funny that Roger Federer is mentioned in this book, Range. They talk of Tiger Woods as the specialist and Roger Federer as the generalist. And perhaps Roger Federer didn't reach in tennis the same heights that Tiger Woods reached in golf. But Roger Federer is an exemplary person, which you can't say about Tiger Woods. And that's what generalists tend to be because they take the bigger picture. And we don't care if he's not the best tennis player. He's the most wonderful tennis player. <laughs> wow. wow. Your favorite vacation spot ah. and why you love going there? I do occasionally go to mountains and I like mountains, but I'm a swimmer and a lover of beaches. Coasts with Mediterranean climates and islands are my favorite. The south of France, where I improved my French, is an absolute favorite. California, where I might met my wife, is up there. And of course, I go to visit her family very often, so I'm often in California. As for islands, Maldives, Seychelles, I went to the uh, Mauritius. We, my wife and I went to, for a honeymoon to Kenya, where she was born, as well as Seychelles and Mauritius. Fiji, where I once went on a business trip and had a wonderful time. 
Martinique, where I went with my son after a Caribbean cruise. It's French island. And whereas in France, you have lots and lots of local specialist wines. In Martinique, you have lots and lots of local specialist rums. Uh, and Hawaii. I once wrote a poem about Maui. If you have some time, I can read it. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> a crooked line has traced the fate of the wandering Pacific plate as it traverses a hot spot, creating islands dot by dot. And Maui was the one we chose. And there before us two humps rose. Maui, you see, is still intact. She's very young and still well stacked. Kukui now will slowly shrink as land below begins to sink. Haleakala on the fringe of the hot spot can have a binge. And someday soon the central plain will be submerged by sea and rain. By helicopter we saw sights beyond imagination's flights. Over the crater we did fly where Pele the goddess once did fly. A fiery show across the sky upstaging any 4th of July. But then we saw a soothing scene, pillars of water framed in green, Kahulawe, Lanai, Molokai, majestically rose in the sky. And down below, Molokini, the bottom half of a bikini, for those who look with a lecherous eye at half a crater from the sky, encompassing so many treasures, so full of palpitating pleasures for those who bravely choose to strive, for those who swim and those who dive. Was it the sea or firmament that put us in our element? Or should we blame the crazy moon for putting us in such a swoon and for the many wondrous fashions in which we pandered to our passions? I hasten to add that I went there with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> With all the bikini references. <laughs> well played on that one, Mr. Gordon. Uh, we shouldn't. We should continue this conversation. I, I, I think we shouldn't wrap this up at all. <laughs> Mr. Gordon, this has been a truly unique episode of Minding My Business, the CEO story, and we have only you to thank for that. Incredible. I mean, thank you for bringing so much character, so much flavor, and so much verse to the show. And I loved your combination of poetry and prose and data points. I have to agree with Ramesh when he says this was our most unique episode thus far. Uh, what is it that they say? Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir. Or actually, in France, we prefer to say à bientôt. À bientôt. Okay. <laughs> I shall remember that. Thank you very, very much. It's been such a pleasure and such an honor. And I, I wish great health for, you, for your family and you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bye, Thank you, Rishi. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Okay. So, Ramesh, a creative mind and a visionary who also runs companies. What do you think? Isn't Mr. Nadir Godridge just amazing? Crazy. Uh, I mean, uh, Rishi, there are very few people. I, I don't know of any. I haven't heard of any chairman or managing director, CEO on this planet who who can use their right brain and their left brain with equal dexterity and, and Mr. Godridge is definitely one of them. That's an well, true incredible that. one. True that. Though I have to say, Ramesh, you're not doing uh, too badly in that department <laughs> that is using both sides of the brain department. You're also a radio and podcast host now. Uh, rest of you, thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure you keep listening to some great radio and podcasts. Build that habit. And come back next week for another amazing episode. Yes, minding my business, the CEO story shall be back with another captain of the industry who's also been a path breaker. Remember, you can catch us on 94.3 Radio 1 on FM Radio and on HD Smartcast in podcast form over all major streaming platforms. This is a Radio 1 production. So till next week, it's bye from me, Rishi K. And me, Ramesh Menon. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you don't miss out on more content.